Hello everyone and welcome back to Crisis of Crime. I'm Rachel Means and I'm a criminologist. Thanks for joining me today to learn about some more criminological theories. So this is the part two of criminological theories. If you haven't checked out the first video, I suggest that you go watch it right here. We're going to be going over eight theories today. The first four are going to be more traditional and popular theories, and the second four are going to be very controversial. So settle up, cowboy. We are going for a wild ride. <laughs> Environmental criminology is like an umbrella term. It has a lot of theories underneath of it. So in general, environmental criminology essentially says that you need to have an offender who is ready to offend and an opportunity to offend. And we're not going to never have somebody who wants to commit a crime. There's always going to be somebody who's ready to offend. So according to environmental criminology, we can manipulate that second factor, the opportunity to offend. Essentially, we can create the presence or the absence of that opportunity. For example, if you have a house that doesn't have an alarm system and nobody is home, there's more opportunity there for somebody to break in and steal something, to commit a burglary. So if we installed an alarm system or hired a house sitter, we're gonna decrease the chances that somebody is going to wanna burglarize that house. So we're manipulating that second factor, changing the opportunity. Probably the most popular theory under environmental criminology would be the routine activities theory. And it was published in 1979 by Cohen and Felsen. According to routine activities theory, you need three things for a crime to occur. You need a motivated offender, a suitable target, and a lack of capable guardianship. So it's very similar to environmental criminology, but they're taking that opportunity to offend and breaking it down a little bit further. So we still have someone who's ready to offend or a motivated offender. And then routine activities theory is breaking it down to a suitable target and the lack of capable guardianship rather than just an opportunity to offend. Routine activities theory also focuses on our routine activities, as the name says. So if we go to a certain bar all the time, our chances of becoming a suitable target at that bar or on our way to or from that bar increase rather than if we were sitting at home. Same if you go for a walk in a certain park every day. Well, you're more likely to become a suitable target at that park rather than sitting in your home. I feel like routine activities theory is trying to get us all to be agoraphobic. It's not really. Maybe. This theory came about because researchers noticed a difference in the culture of the United States post-World War II. More women were entering the workforce or going to school, so there were more people to be suitable targets out on the streets. Also, more homes were left empty for longer parts of the day as well, with women going to work and to school. With the man working as well, people wouldn't be home, and their houses became suitable targets for burglaries. With environmental criminology, the opportunity to offend would be like the house with no security system. Routine activities theory is just breaking that down further, saying suitable target and a lack of capable guardianship. So if we use that same example, the house is the suitable target and the absence of the security system is the lack of capable guardianship. So people being out on the streets more are suitable targets if they're in an area with no one else around or no security cameras or no law enforcement nearby, then there's a lack of capable guardianship. A great example of the routine activities theory in a movie would be in The Fast and the Furious. In the movie, we see Dominic Toretto and his crew robbing semi-trucks carrying electronic equipment. They did so using their crazy good driving skills to essentially commandeer semi-trucks and driving them to undisclosed locations to steal the merchandise. They performed these robberies on deserted stretches of highway, so there were no witnesses, and they would also scan the police radio to ensure that there wouldn't be any law enforcement present. They were motivated offenders, who saw the semi-trucks carrying the electronic equipment as suitable targets, and because they were in a deserted area with no one else around, there was a lack of capable guardianship. According to routine activities theory, we could argue that if the highway had traffic cameras installed every few miles, Toretto's crew wouldn't have been able to get away with their robberies for as long as they did. In fact, at the end of the movie, we see one of the truck drivers has actually decided to arm themselves because they were aware of the previous robberies. When Toretto and his crew see that the truck driver has a gun, they no longer see him as a suitable target, and now they have to work to evacuate the scene with everyone safely. What are you smiling about? Dude, I almost had you. You almost had me? You never had me. You never had your car. Rational Choice Theory was published in 1986 by Cornish and Clark, and it says that individuals are rational beings when they're deciding whether or not to commit a crime. 
They're weighing out the pros and cons, and they're taking a long time to decide whether or not this is something that they should do. And Rational Choice Theory is very particular in saying that people first need to decide whether or not they even want to engage in crime. And then once they decide they are going to engage in crime, they have to decide exactly what kind of crime they want to engage in. If someone decides that they're going to commit a robbery, now they have to decide if it's going to be of a commercial business or of a residential home. And if it's a residential home, is it going to be a middle class house in the suburbs? Is it going to be an apartment in public housing? Or is it going to be a wealthy mansion? And depending on what they decide, what their target is, it's going to change whether or not they want to commit that crime because the pros have to outweigh the cons. And they're going to be making rational decisions based on things like their previous experiences or reliable intel or even their firsthand surveillance. And they're going to take all of that information, weigh it all out, pros and cons, and then decide whether or not they want to move forward. I like to call individuals who commit crimes according to the rational choice theory planners because they are planning out every step and taking everything into consideration and having a contingency for each part. Rational choice theory is similar to classical theory in that both theories state that individuals are rational beings choosing whether or not they want to commit crimes. But with rational choice theory, it's they're weighing out the pros and cons and deciding whether or not committing the crime is a good risk. With classical theory, individuals are rational beings who are only being deterred from committing crimes if the punishment is swift, certain, and severe. So for classical, it's the punishment that's deterring them, and with rational choice, it's the pros versus the cons, benefit versus risk that's going to deter them. If the risk is too high, they're going to make a rational decision not to go through with it. A great example of the rational choice theory from a movie would be in Ocean's Eleven. Danny Ocean has a master plan to rob three Las Vegas casinos, and he's thought through every scenario. He has determined exactly who he needs on his team and what their jobs will entail. Each person is just as important as the next, and they all have to perform their jobs to a T to be able to pull off this heist. Danny and his crew are making rational decisions based on reliable sources, first-hand surveillance, and their previous experiences. The group has weighed out the pros and cons of carrying out this heist, and they have decided that with all their planning and contingencies, the $150 million they will get in return is worth the risk. According to Rational Choice Theory, we could argue that if Danny Ocean and his team hadn't meticulously planned out every step of this heist using rational logic, that one, if not all, of the team members of Ocean's Eleven would have made a rational choice not to go through with the heist because they would have come to the conclusion that they were not prepared enough to execute it. Yeah, well, say we do all that. Uh, we're just supposed to walk out of there with $150 million in cash on us without getting stopped? Yeah. Oh. Okay. The Social Learning Theory was published by Akers in 1985, and his goal was to build onto the theory of differential association published by Sutherland and Cressy in 1939. So Akers' Social Learning Theory doesn't contradict differential association. Instead, everything that's true for differential association is still true in social learning. It just added onto it. It added some more clarification, essentially. In 1966, Akers and Burgess expanded on the idea of differential association reinforcement, which suggested that people's behavior was influenced by rewards and punishments. And this is in the context of social interactions with people. So if your behavior is a certain way, a reward might be that you get more friends or you gain respect from others. And so that's a reward towards your behavior. So you might continue acting that way afterwards, or you might act a certain way and then people react badly to it. So that's gonna be a punishment. If people start to pull away from you or they lose respect for you, then it's gonna make you not wanna behave that way in the future. So Akers continued on with the social learning theory in 1985, expanding on it even further, saying that when we interact with people, it's really an exchange of meanings and symbols and that this meaning and symbols can influence our morals. So we might start out feeling like crime is bad. You should never commit any crimes, no matter what it is. And then we start hanging out with people and our morals start to change just a little bit. So some crimes might be acceptable while others are still immoral. It could be a teenager who starts hanging out with a group of friends and their friends like to drink. So they start to see underage drinking as okay 
okay, even though it's illegal, but they may still think that smoking marijuana, which is illegal in their state, is immoral. A great example of the social learning theory from a movie would be in Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. We meet Will Turner, who is an honest and hardworking blacksmith, and he is in love with Elizabeth Swan, the wealthy daughter of the governor. Will was found lost at sea when he was a boy, and it was rumored that he was the son of a pirate. Elizabeth had always had a fascination with pirates and being out on the open sea. When the town is attacked by Captain Barbosa and his pirates, Elizabeth goes on board the Black Pearl to try to negotiate with him, being kidnapped in the process. Will teams up with Captain Jack Sparrow, a pirate who was previously marooned by Captain Barbosa, to go after Elizabeth and save her. In the beginning of the movie, Will wants nothing to do with pirates, and he certainly doesn't want to be one himself. He cares about following the laws and contributing to society. As the movie progresses, he spends more time with Captain Jack Sparrow and other pirates, and he begins to see himself more as an outlaw. And eventually, at the end of the movie, he even claims that he is a pirate. According to social learning theory, we could argue that if Will had not chased after Elizabeth and wasn't in the company of Captain Jack Sparrow and the other pirates, that he would have never become a pirate himself. Everyone stay calm, we are taking over the ship. I am us! <laughs> The control theory is like environmental criminology in that it's kind of an umbrella term. Control theory suggests that people commit crimes when their bonds to society are broken. One of the most popular sub-theories of control theory is the social bond theory, and it was published by Hershey in 1969. And it states that individuals commit crimes when their bonds are broken from society, but Hershey goes on to say that other theories such as the strain theory were incorrect because they painted an individual as a blank slate. Hershey, on the other hand, believe that individuals would naturally break the law. So instead of asking the question, why do people offend? He was asking the question, why don't people offend? And the answer, of course, is the control that society has on individuals. But when those bonds are broken, they will break the law. And Hershey's social bond theory was mainly talking about kids and how they can detach from society depending on how their relationship is with their parents or with school. So if they were to detach from their parents, and from their school that they would be more likely to be defiant and delinquent. And Hershey believed that this social bond could strengthen and weaken throughout someone's life. So say they get older and they get married and they have a really great marriage and it strengthens their bond to society. They want to be a better contributor now than when they were younger and they weren't very attached to school or their family. Now it's important to note that as Hershey got older, he began to contradict himself. He teamed up with Godfredson, another researcher, to write a general theory of crime in which they both suggested that it wasn't the bonds that would be broken that would cause people to commit crimes, whether they were detaching from their parents or from school, but rather it was something inherent in kids that determined whether or not they would bond with society at all. So it had nothing to do with the external factors. It was all an internal factor in each child determining whether or not they're gonna bond with society and that it would remain that way throughout their entire lives. So essentially, a kid who doesn't bond with society and becomes a delinquent kid is going to become an adult that still doesn't bond with society who's an offending adult. And they claim that it was the lack of self-control from them not being able to bond with their society that caused them to commit crimes. So this is also known as the self-control theory. A great example of the social bond theory from a movie would be in Carrie. In the beginning of the movie, we see a young girl named Carrie White who wants to fit in at school and gain approval from her mother. She is constantly bullied and teased at school, and her mother is a religious extremist who emotionally abuses her daily. Throughout the movie, Carrie realizes that she's a telekinetic, so she can move things with her mind. Carrie is invited to prom by a good-looking classmate as a way to apologize for all the bullying she has endured, but unfortunately, her bullies decide to use that opportunity to cause her more pain. They rigged the prom king and queen election, so Carrie ends up being crowned prom queen. When she's accepting her crown, her bullies dump pig's blood all over her head. This causes Carrie to lose control. She completely detaches from her society, and in a full outrage, she sets the school ablaze, destroying the school and killing or injuring everyone inside. She continues to wreak havoc on the town. According to the social bond theory, we could argue that if Carrie had not suffered from the bullying, nor did she have have an emotionally abusive mother, she would not have detached from society the way she did. 
Herod, causing the death and destruction throughout her town. And it is likely that it would have been enough not to cause her to detach if she had an emotionally supportive mother at home who could help her cope with the bullying or supportive friends at school who could help her cope with her emotionally abusive mother. But because there was no outlet for her to cope with the stressors in her life, she detached completely. God, you suck. <laughs> So that's it for our traditional and popular theories. So now we're gonna move on to our controversial theories. So get ready, cause things are about to get weird. For our first controversial theory, we're gonna talk about the modern evolutionary theory. And it suggests that there are certain traits within our society that are there because they were favorable to natural selection. Essentially, people who are better at passing on their genetic code are gonna be more likely to survive in their lineage. So according to the modern evolutionary theory, certain traits that cause certain behaviors are going to be more advantageous for passing on that genetic material. And it's going to be behaviors like deception and cheating and sexual aggression. A scenario where deception might be one of those behaviors would be a man who essentially is saying anything to a woman to get her to go home with him to bed. Because even if consciously he's not thinking, I want to get this woman pregnant, on a primal level with his traits, he has this desire to bed women to increase his chances to pass on his genetic code. Cheating is one of those behaviors because even if a man is in a committed relationship, they might feel like they need to see people on the side to increase their chances of continuing their lineage. So he might be able to have one baby every two years with the woman he's with, but if he has this drive to continue procreating, he might cheat and get another woman pregnant on the side. And the last one, sexual aggression, which of course is the most controversial one, is suggesting that rape might be advantageous for natural selection because men who rape are increasing their chances of continuing their lineage. So according to modern evolutionary theory, it's suggesting that men who commit rape are doing it not because of what other theories suggest, which is like a, a power thing. They're suggesting it's because they are trying to continue their lineage. On a subconscious primal level, men who commit rape have these behaviors, these inherent traits that are pushing them to try to continue their lineage. In modern evolutionary theory suggests that it doesn't always have to be about sex and finding a partner. It can also be child abuse, neglect, and infanticide, or killing of an infant. And that's because parents might be pushing for their most viable offspring to continue on their lineage. So according to the modern evolutionary theory, this is why large families tend to have higher chances of child abuse and neglect because parents are choosing which one of their children is going to be most likely to succeed and continue on their lineage, aka they're more likely to continue reproducing. A great example of the modern evolutionary theory in a movie would be in 300. We see King Leonidas and the Spartans as a strong and powerful faction. Everyone is beautiful, strong, and in perfect health. They are able to achieve this because they are attempting to achieve genetic superiority through infanticide. Each baby that is born in Sparta is inspected for any physical or mental deformities. If they are found to have one, they are killed. As the boys in the community get older, they endure intensive physical testing to become men and warriors. We see a flashback of King Leonidas' life when he is sent out to fight a wolf. If he survives and comes home, then he can become a man. If the wolf kills him, then they won't have a weak warrior in their ranks. According to modern evolutionary theory, because this community as a whole is attempting to reach genetic superiority, they will likely pass on the traits that cause the same behaviors in their children, continuing the cycle of infanticide. We also see a corrupt politician named Theron rape the queen because she is desperate for his help in sending additional troops to her husband, King Leonidas. According to the modern evolutionary theory, we could argue that Theron committed this rape because on a primal level, he was attempting to carry on his lineage. You bring the crowns and heads of conquered kings to my city steps. You insult my queen. You threaten my people with slavery and death. This is Sparta! <laughs> Such a controversial theory. The radical theory is based on Marxist ideas, and it essentially states that laws are put in place by the rich and powerful elite 
to benefit them and to oppress the general population. Since the wealthy elites are the ones who are deciding what constitutes a crime and what the punishment should be, we often see that crimes that challenge the social, economic, and political order are often labeled as terrorism. Radical criminologists believe that we shouldn't be focusing on the individual offender and their punishment. Because when we do that, it takes away from the big picture of what is actually happening, that this group of wealthy elite are actually controlling the general population through laws and punishments. So when we focus on the individual person and their punishment, then it's taking the blame away from the wealthy elite. It's putting our focus elsewhere. So radical criminologists believe that other non-radical criminologists and people in the general public who are focusing on the individual offender are essentially letting the wealthy elite get away with their puppeteering because they fear retribution. Additionally, radical criminologists also believe that the entire American institution has been built on the systematic oppression of minorities, specifically Black or African American people. And that's why we still see oppression, segregation, and discrimination against Black or African American people in our society today. A great example of radical criminology from a movie would be in The Hunger Games. In the movie, we see the continent of Pan Am broken into 13 districts in the capital. Those who reside in the capital are the wealthy elites, and they want for nothing. The capital controls all of the districts. The Hunger Games is an annual event where two individuals from each district are placed in an arena where they must fight to the death. And this is a form of entertainment for those who reside in the capital. Essentially, those who are living in the districts are considered less than human by those living in the capital. They use their lives as a form of entertainment. The capital has also placed peacekeepers in every district who are there to enforce the law and punish those who break it. The laws in each district are there to oppress the people and to benefit the wealthy elite living in the capital. So if people in the districts break the law, it's punished not because it's wrong, but because it goes against the powerful elite and they won't allow that to happen because they refuse to show weakness. And that's also why crimes such as retaliation and rioting are punished much more severely than something like a theft would be. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Happy Hunger Games. And may the odds be ever in your favor. A sub-theory of the radical theory is the radical theory of feminist criminology, and it puts the patriarchy at the center of the theory. Essentially, women commit crimes because they are oppressed by a patriarchal society. According to the radical theory of feminist criminology, we can see that we live in a patriarchal society because many U.S. laws promote female gender roles and control what a woman can and cannot do with her own body. We also see gender inequality in sentencing for women. Lastly, the radical theory of feminist criminology points out that the patriarchy is conducive to the physical and sexual abuse of women. And studies show that the majority of women offenders and delinquent girls have experienced some form of physical or sexual abuse during their lifetime. If you want to learn more about the feminist theories of criminology, I suggest you check out my previous podcast titled Gender, Crime, and the Problem of Prostitution. You can find that in the link above. A great example of the radical theory of feminist criminology from a movie would be in Thelma and Louise. Thelma and Louise are two close friends living in Arkansas. They head out for a weekend vacation in the mountains. And on the way, they stop at a tavern for a night of drinking and dancing. Thelma dances with a man who walks her outside and proceeds to try to rape her. Louise finds them, pulling a gun on the man, stopping him in the act, and shoots him dead. Now Thelma and Louise are on the run from the police. Throughout the timeline of the movie, we see Thelma and Louise becoming more relaxed and not fitting into traditional female gender roles. They become outlaws. They rob a convenience store and blow up a semi-truck. The defining event that set these women on a path of crime was the man who attempted to rape Thelma. According to the radical theory of feminist criminology, we could argue that if that man had not tried to dominate and oppress Thelma by trying to rape her, that these women would have never fallen into a life of crime. Something's like crossed over in me and I can't go back. I mean, I just couldn't live. I know. I love that movie so much. They're so badass. Our last controversial theory for the day is the theory of African American offending. And it was published in 2011 by Univer and Gabadon. According to the theory of African American offending, 
parents of black or African-American children must prepare their kids to live in a society that's going to systematically oppress them. And they need to do this by racially socializing them. And if they don't do that, then it's going to increase their chances of criminality. So I wanna be very clear. This is not a theory suggesting that black people commit crimes more than any other race. It's saying that black or African-American children need to learn how to cope with the society that they live in, the society that's oppressing them because of the color of their skin. So it's not saying black people commit more crimes than other races. I cannot emphasize that enough, and I don't want that to be anybody's takeaway. I also just wanna say on a side note that it is not lost on me that I am in fact a white woman talking about the theory of African-American offending, but since this is a channel about education on criminology and we're talking about crime theories, I think that it's important to talk about. The theory of African-American offending suggests that every black or African-American person is going to have a similar worldview and that at some point in their lives, they will be discriminated against because of the color of their skin. According to this theory, parents of black or African-American children must racially socialize their children by teaching them three things, how to interact with other black people, how to interact with other races, and how to cope with their minority status. So if they're unable to do those three things, to teach their children those three things, then there's three possible outcomes according to this theory. In the first scenario, if parents don't racially socialize their children at all, then the kids are going to be blindsided when they realize that society is oppressing them because of the color of their skin and they won't know how to deal with it. And it may cause behaviors that have potentially harmful consequences, such as anger, hostility, defiance, depression, and weak social bonds. And as we talked about previously, if you have weak social bonds with society, if that bond breaks, then you're more likely to commit crimes. And then the other behaviors, such as defiance, hostility, and anger, may lead someone to have less self-control, as we've also talked about, if you have less self-control, you're more likely to commit a crime. The second scenario would be if parents racially socialize their children, but they teach them to mistrust white institutions and white people. So a white institution would be something like the government or the criminal justice system. So if black or African-American children are growing up not trusting the institutions around them, then according to this theory, they're more likely to take racial discrimination on a personal level, as a personal attack against them, and that's going to, in turn, lower their self-control. And as we've talked about, that does increase your chances for offending. In the last scenario, if parents racially socialize their children, but they don't give them any coping mechanisms to deal with the society that oppresses them, then they may be more vulnerable to falling into the stigma society places on them. So if a stigma in society about Black or African American people is something negative that leads to crime, then that person who was racially socialized but has no way to cope with it might believe that stigma and succumb to it. So naturally that increases their risk for offending. So much like the radical theory of feminist criminology, Oppression is leading to criminality, but in this case specifically with Black or African American people, it's saying if they're not racially socialized by their parents that it's going to increase their risk of criminality. A great example of the theory of African American offending in a movie would be from Boys in the Hood. We are introduced to a young group of boys who are all friends. The main character is Trey Stiles, a young boy who is going to live with his father after getting into some trouble at school. His dad wants to help him become a man by having him do chores, and he teaches him some wise rules about being a good leader, such as always looking someone in the eye because it'll make them respect you more. Two of Trey's best friends are a pair of brothers, Ricky and Darren, or Doughboy. Their mother, Mrs. Baker, tells Doughboy that he isn't ever going to amount to anything, and he's lazy. It's clear that she isn't an outlet for him to cope with the world he lives in as a young African-American boy. We see Doughboy getting into trouble for stealing when he's young and he's in and out of juvenile detention for the rest of his youth. When he grows up, we see that he still has a tendency to offend. According to the theory of African-American offending, we could argue that if Mrs. Baker had been there as an outlet for Doughboy, for him to cope with his reality of living in a world that oppresses him, he would have not been a delinquent boy who grew up to be an adult offender. Ricky, on the other hand, Doughboy's brother, is praised by their mother. Ricky is a tall, handsome, and smart young man with dreams of getting a scholarship to play football at a university. His mother supports him throughout his entire childhood to chase his dreams. 
This falls more under the modern evolutionary theory. We could say that Mrs. Baker was more invested in Ricky because subconsciously, she thought he was a better offspring to carry on her lineage. Turned on the TV this morning. Had to put on about, about living in a violent, a violent world. Showed all these foreign places. Foreigners living on. I started thinking, man. Either they don't know, don't show, or don't care about what's going on in the hood. All right, folks, so that's all the theories for today. Let me know what you think in the comments below, or you can find me on Twitter at Crisis of Crime. Be sure to check out my website at crisisofcrime.com. If you're enjoying the YouTube channel and the podcast, please consider supporting Crisis of Crime through Patreon. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see y'all next time.